So today I'm gonna to show you guys the very basics of what goes on inside a differential assembly. Think of this video as differentials 101. If you guys know nothing about differentials, this is the video that you wanna watch. Um, my goal here is to have you guys watch this video and have a basic understanding of what is actually going on inside the differential assembly. And then hopefully you can either make the decision of, okay, I'm capable of rebuilding a differential or at least recognizing the fact that, you know what, this may be above my skill set and I need to pay somebody to do this for me. So with all that in mind, let me bring you over to the bench and we're just gonna break it down to the very basics, what's inside a differential, what's involved in setting one up and what you need to pay attention to as far as um, rebuilding one. All right, so when you break a differential down to its most basic components, you're pretty much left with the two components that you see in front of you. Um, this is a ring gear and this is a pinion. Now, the pinion actually splines to the drive shaft flange. So if you look at the drive shaft flange inside there, there's splines that match up with the splines on the pinion. So the two of these components match up something like that. And when the drive shaft spins, it spins this pinion. Now, the pinion sits like this on the ring gear, and as this pinion spins, it spins the ring gear. Um, basically what you need to know is the ring gear is bolted to the tires through a, a few different components, but essentially one revolution of the ring gear equals one revolution of the tires. So when you are rebuilding a differential, um, there are three different things that you're paying attention to when you're setting this up. Because what ultimately you're trying to do here when you rebuild a differential is yes, first of all, you're gonna replace all the bearings and seals related to these components. But the other thing that you're doing here is you're changing how these two gears interact with one another and you wanna get these gears set up so the center of the pinion contacts the center of the ring gear. All of this is adjusted with shims. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is gonna be pinion depth. And like I said, the pinion depth is changed by adding and subtracting shims from the backside of the pinion. So the only way that you can change these shims is take this whole assembly back apart, press off a bearing, change your shim, and then put it all back together and try it and see if it's correct. So there's a lot of trial and error in involving setting up a ring and pinion assembly, but essentially all pinion depth really is, is how far this pinion sticks out into the case. So I can run a very shallow pinion depth, something like this, where I have poor engagement up here along this edge, or I could run very deep pinion depth, where you can see down at the bottom here, you know, that uh, pinion is not engaging very well with the ring gear. You want these two components to pretty much engage the center of one another so you get optimal wear, low noise, and a long life. So the next thing you need to pay attention to when you're rebuilding a differential is going to be the backlash. And what backlash is, is essentially how the two gears on the pinion and the ring gear how tightly those two gears are meshing with one another. It's kind of the same thing as the pinion depth. You adjust all of this with shims. So you can sit here and you can run it like this and you're gonna have a high backlash or you can run it very tight like this and you're gonna have a low backlash. So what you're doing when you're adjusting backlash is you're adjusting the ring gear left to right in the case where it actually sits in the case in relation to the pinion. The pinion does not move in the case. The only thing that you can change with the pinion is the pinion depth. So you can move it in and out like this, but as far as the backlash is concerned, the only way that you can change it is by moving the ring gear left to right. You do that with shims on most vehicles. Um, there are some vehicles out there that use like adjuster screws, just depends on obviously what you own. The other thing you need to pay attention to here is if you make a pinion depth change, you see how this pinion is tapered on both sides? So if you change the depth on the pinion, like you make it stick further into the case, that is gonna change your backlash. It's gonna make your backlash tighter the further the pinion goes out into the case because of this taper. Now, just on the opposite side of that coin, if you reduce the pinion depth, it's going to increase the backlash and you're going to have to move the ring gear 
in closer to the pinion to get it to engage correctly and get your backlash back into specification. So these two things that I just talked about, the pinion depth and the backlash are 100% correlated with one another. A change in pinion depth will change backlash. A change in backlash will not change pinion depth. I hope that makes sense. Um, there is one final thing that we need to talk about here in regards to differential setup and that is going to be bearing preload. So when this assembly is in the axle housing, it's gonna look something like this um, for initial setup. I do not have a pinion seal in here, but on final assembly, naturally, you're gonna use a pinion seal. So what you're doing here is you are essentially tightening this nut, which draws in the pinion flange, which pushes this bearing right here towards the lower pinion bearing. You're, you're setting the tension essentially between these two bearings by tightening this nut. This tension is measured in uh, resistance to rotational force in inch pounds. So if you have these bearings set too close together, meaning you tighten the pinion nut too far, you're gonna have too much preload and there's gonna be too much resistance for these bearings to turn and you're gonna have reduced bearing life and excess heat. On the opposite side of that coin, if you have too much space between these two bearings, it's gonna largely cause the same issues. Um, it's gonna cause excess heat in a shortened bearing life leading to premature bearing failure, causing you to have to do this, old, this entire job over again. Now, like I was saying a second ago, with this crush sleeve, you can see the difference in thickness between the two crush sleeves I have here. So essentially, this crush sleeve, once you crush the crush sleeve, if you make these bearings too close together and you tighten this assembly too tight and it crushes this crush sleeve too far, you can't just loosen the pinion nut to space these bearings back out because then you have a gap here. What you have to do is you have to take the whole assembly back apart and use a fresh crush sleeve. So the crush sleeves are one time use. So now that you have a very basic understanding of pinion depth, backlash, and finally bearing preload, I'm just gonna take a second now to sort of explain some of the other parts that may be involved in a differential rebuild. And in addition to that, some of the considerations you may wanna make if it's a performance application or an off-road application. What are some of the other options you have for part selection? depending on what sort of scenario you're gonna put this vehicle through. I thought I would just show you guys some of the parts that I'm gonna be putting into this differential um, to rebuild it. So starting out over here on the left, this is a master install kit from Ford. And what this includes is essentially every bearing, every seal, um, and every shim that you would need to essentially rebuild the differential. The stuff that you see over here on the right, this is stuff that either A, you're going to buy for a performance application, or B, you had some sort of catastrophic failure and you may have to replace one of these parts. At any rate, this stuff that you see over here on the right, now this is the ring and pinion that I showed you earlier, but the difference is this ring and pinion, if you look at this, this is a 410 rig and pinion. And when you compare it to the stock ring and pinion, you can see that there is a large difference in size between the two parts. So this is my stock pinion. This is the 410. So what that means is this pinion takes 4.10 turns to make one revolution of the ring gear. The stock pinion takes 3.27 turns of the pinion to equal one turn of the ring gear. So when you change out to a different ratio from this stock ratio and you go to a lower one like this 410, what this does is this gives the engine a greater mechanical advantage over the tire and helps the vehicle to accelerate quicker. There is one downside to this. So with this 3.27 to 1 gear set in this differential at 70 miles an hour, the engine turns at 2000 RPM. Because I'm changing this gear ratio to a 410, this means that the engine is going to have an increased RPM on the highway because this is a lower ratio to make it accelerate quicker. So 
at 70 miles an hour, the engine may turn 26, 2700 RPM now, as opposed to 2000 with the other gear set. So this is what you're kind of playing with when you start changing gear ratios like this. Yes, you're getting acceleration, but you're also gonna turn more RPM on the highway. So it kind of depends on what you really want. So this next piece I have back here is a new differential. This is a Torsen T2 differential from Ford Racing. This is a 31 spline differential. And that means I have to use 31 spline axles to work with this dis differential assembly. Um, the Torsen differential is a gear driven limited slip. So there's no parts in here really to wear out but the downside to that is this unit is not rebuildable. So once this unit goes bad, that's it. You throw it away and you get another one. My stock differential was a clutch pack style differential. These clutch pack style differentials, um, when they get higher mileage on them, they really do not transmit much torque from one axle to the other, and they require rebuilds probably every 50,000 miles um, depending on how the vehicle is driven. So, the stock one is rebuildable, the Torsen is not, but the Torsen is much less likely to wear out versus what the stock one is. Now, in addition to the Torsen, I also sprung for a new pinion flange because let's face it, when you're into it this far, what's another $40 on a brand new pinion flange so you can pretty much guarantee you won't have any leaks? I also went out and got some new C-clips for the axles. And finally, this is a spacer that I'm gonna install instead of a crush sleeve. So now, like I alluded to a second ago, one of the easiest things to change in a differential is the gear ratio of the ring and pinion. Changing the gear ratio of the ring and pinion is an extremely popular upgrade for people that do off-roading or fit larger tires than stock to their vehicle. The reason for that is when you increase the tire size, it effectively makes the gear ratio of the vehicle taller than what it is stock. So it essentially would take something like this 327 ratio, and let's say if you went up in tire size, it may turn that into a 308 or a 273, making the vehicle harder to accelerate and making it seem like it has less power. So typically people that put oversized tires on their vehicle, they will go numerically higher with the gear ratio, which means it takes more revolutions of the pinion gear to make one revolution of the ring gear to compensate for that additional tire size. This formula here is how you would calculate that. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your new tire size, divide it by your old tire size, and multiply that number that you get by the current gear ratio of the rear end. That is gonna give you the new gear ratio required. So, for example, my pickup truck has a set of 31 inch tires on it. If I wanted to upgrade to a set of 35 inch tires on it, I would divide 35 by 31, and then times that by my stock ratio, which is 3.42. So, to give me effectively the same ratio as a 31 inch tire with a 3.42 gear set, the 35 inch tire would need a 3.86 gear set. So in that instance, I would probably step up to a 410 or 4.10 like I spoke to earlier. So what that would do is essentially make a 35 inch tall tire behave like a 31 inch tall tire because you manipulated the gear ratio of the ring and pinion. So guys, that's pretty much what I have for this video. If you guys are interested in finding out more information regarding differential rebuilds, I shot an actual differential rebuild video, like a how-to style video on how to rebuild a differential. Um, I will have a card up in the corner and down in the description to that video if you guys are interested. Uh, I'm gonna forewarn you guys that video is about an hour long just to be able to take that process from start to finish. That's, it is what it is. You know, it, when you break it right down, there's really only two gears inside a differential housing and you're gonna spend hours and hours setting up how those two gears mesh with one another. It's just the nature of what you're doing. 
So guys, I will also have links down in the description to any differential rebuild tools that you guys may need throughout this process if you guys are interested in any of that stuff. And as always guys, if you guys like the video, hit like. If you wanna see more content, go down and hit subscribe. Thanks for watching guys. Mm -hmm.